All right, good afternoon. It is December 12th, <laughs> 2020. And we are at the Free Black Women's Library virtual corner of the world right now since we're in Corona. Let me fix the view so that both of us are seen like equally. Yeah, that's better. Um, so yeah, I'm really, really excited today because I'm talking to an amazing, super talented writer, Black woman writer. Um, I first discovered, I don't know if discovered is the right word. I first discovered this amazing book on a random walk with some friends. We went into Barnes and Noble to use the bathroom. <laughs> <laughs> and I saw this book, you know how they have like the black section, there's like mm -hmm. a whole bunch of books and everything. So I always check out that section. That's be just mm -hmm. because. And I saw this photo and the title and I was like, what? The Secret Lives of Church Ladies? Let me find <laughs> out. I grew up um, in a very church family, like mm -hmm. in so, you know, I was like, mm, I wonder what that's about. I wasn't sure if it was like a memoir or if it was mm -hmm. like a study of church women. It, my mind went to so many different places. And then right. when I picked it up and saw it was a short story collection, I was like, oh shit. I love <laughs> short story collections. I'm cursing a lot. Good. I like to curse. <laughs> I need to check myself. Um, so, you know, I could not afford to get it at the time. That was like months ago. Um, and I posted on my Instagram and I was like, can somebody buy me this book? <laughs> and then I think you commented or sent me a message. I don't know. Yeah, I've you. been trying to send them. I just reset them this week. So. I yes, that. I appreciate that. Um, <laughs> And so, so someone tagged you and you commented and I was like, oh my goodness, she's like very accessible. I always get excited when I post a, a book of a writer, my mm -hmm. Instagram comment, because it's like, oh, this person is not like this mythic being. Right, no. Out in no. the universe, this is a real flesh and body person. So mm -hmm. that made it exciting. And, um, you know, I got the book. Um, anonymous person sent it to me through Amazon and I read it like I inhaled it. Oh, thank you. It's like, oh my God, I really love this book. And if this were not for Corona, I would probably try to figure out some way to bring you to New York. Oh, I would love that. <laughs> and like sign books and stuff. But Corona's trying to, you know, if Corona won't let us be great. Trump is a cop blocker, like the ultimate block. Yes. Of things. Ooh, say it. Say it. That's, oh. that's what Corona is right now. So, mm -hmm. but it's fine because we got Zoom. We make do. We yeah. make do. So, I say all that to say welcome to Thank you. my little virtual corner, the Free Black Women's Library chat conversation, Disha. Filial. Am I saying your last name correctly? Yes, you did. That is right. <laughs> yeah. Shafilia, um, writer. I'm going to read the little blurb on the back. Okay. Um, it says, Disha Filia's writing on race, parenting, gender, and culture has appeared in the New York Times, the Washington Post, McSweeney's, The Rumpus, Brevity, Tonight, and elsewhere. Originally from Jacksonville, Florida, she currently lives in Pittsburgh with her daughters. And she is the writer of The Secret Lives of Church Ladies, which is like one of the, probably one of the best books I read in 2020, period. Thank you. And it's exciting because a lot of people agree, like millions of people <laughs> agree. This book is super popular, super successful. Congratulations. Thank you. Love. Um, I love that you're getting like so much shine for it because it's so good. It's so Thank good. you. Um, so yeah. How are you doing? Welcome. Um, thank you. I'm doing so book wise, I'm great. You know, I'm loving and appreciating all of the wonderful 
um, the wonderful response to the book. Um, but I'm in Rona, like everybody else, and the isolation, it's hard. It's really, really hard that we have to be isolated just to be safe. That, you know, this moment is still very surreal. Um, some days are easier than others. Um, I have this virtual book tour, um, mm -hmm. so I'm more thankful than ever because it's helping me to feel more connected um, than I would be otherwise. Um, but I, I just say I'm okay, all things considered. Yeah, you know, all Rona things considered. So yeah, are you? Um, would you consider yourself an extrovert? Like, are you really miss uh, missing that human like interaction? Right. I, I for years I thought I was an extrovert, um, just because I do enjoy being with people, and you know I'll spark a conversation and, and things like that. But when I really understood what extroversion and introversion was, I realized, oh, I'm actually an introvert. Like I can do that, but it takes a lot out of me. And the way that I refill is, you know, is with more, not, it doesn't even have to be solitude, but I don't get energized by being engaged, oh, right? Okay. I, um, I enjoy it, um, but, but the, my energy comes from, another place and uh and so i think this virtual book tour is good for folks like me where i'm enjoying the the um the interactions but then i i simultaneously miss being able to go out to dinner afterwards and have drinks with people but there's yeah. also a part of me that feels like um i do get to rest after each one and that's great you know and i realized like if i had to pick i would kind of pick the rest mm -hmm. part of it um i'm probably someone who should go out with people beforehand because then after like an event i am ready to like shut it down you yeah. know yeah yeah wow did you this is this might be an odd question but mm -hmm. when you were writing this book and when mm -hmm. you were putting it out to the world did you imagine that it would be this popular and this successful? No, um, it's such a little book. Um, it's short stories, which, you know, short story form has its fans, but generally speaking, um, they're regarded as, as a, regarded as a hard sell, not super mo marketable. You don't see uh, prior to this year, <laughs> you don't see a lot, see a lot of short story collections getting um, the awards and recognition and that sort of thing. Uh, it's on a small press. It's on a um, university press. Yeah. Um, so having it have this commercial success, um, as well as, you know, um, being very popular with readers, I did not imagine any of that any of it so it's been a very pleasant surprise that's amazing but you knew you were writing some bomb shit, right i knew i was writing something that we hadn't seen in a while you know i mean i think about like um tony k bambara's work mm -hmm. um you know these are people that other early readers kind of made reference to um, or Jay California Cooper. Mm -hmm. And um, and so, you know, just us, just our gaze, nobody else's gaze, um, all of the stuff, pleasure, secrecy, shame, um, boldness, you know, all of that, all of the facets of who we are, it's been a while. And, and where the women themselves are centered, in relationship to each other and to themselves. Um, my friend, Damon Youngs, I think he said it best. He was like, men are garnished, <laughs> garnish, not garnish, garnish. You know, if you think of it as the book is a meal, they are garnished. Yeah. And, yeah. Uh, okay. and there's no white gaze, you know, like we're always fighting. And so, um, you know, I knew I was ready for a book like this. I, I love reading about us. I love reading us. Um, it's very Southern, yeah. um, cause I am, um, so those facets, I knew it was special and I hoped that the women, um, the black women would see themselves and would feel seen and heard in these stories. 
Um, but did I didn't imagine the magnitude. Um, I knew that these stories were also accessible to people who aren't Black women mm -hmm. because, um, you know, Toni Morrison said it and August Wilson said it, that like Black life contains all of human experience. If you can tell our specific stories and those are universal stories. Um, so I knew that people who weren't Black women could access and connect with these stories. I didn't know if they would, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. but I knew they could. Um, and I'm happy that they have. Um, so yes, yeah, so I felt good about it. I was excited having a book that I finished. It's like, I finished something <laughs> and somebody wants to publish it. Um, so that was exciting for me. And I, you know, anything else, you know, I, I, it, it, it's gravy, um, but just to have a book in the world um, and, and we, the conversation was just reignited yesterday about publishing being so white. So to have such a black book in the world is also fantastic. Yeah, yeah, it really is, it really is. And I, you know, I was fascinated with all the characters and with the mm -hmm. common threads between the characters. Mm -hmm. So I'm curious to know, you know, when you were coming up with the story, is this something that, took place over time mm -hmm. or what, did it all come at once? Like, how did you, how did you capture these beautiful, rich, like lives in these mm -hmm. compact moments? Yeah, I would say at this, by, at this, by this date, the oldest story in that collection is sort of pushing on five years from like, but it could have been five years ago, I just wrote like a sentence or a paragraph yeah. and then came back to it, which is very typical for me. My stories typically take um, a long time to write um, because it'll start with an idea and I'm not sure what I wanna do and then I'll come back to it. So that represents about half the book. Um, and then some of the other stories were written last year um, because I got a book deal and, and I got a, a deadline that was tighter than typical because the publisher wanted my book to lead the fall 2020 catalog, which meant I had to turn it in uh, September 1st of last year and my publication date was September 1st of this year. And, um, and so uh, when I got the book deal, the book was about halfway done and then I had to you know, finish it. Some of those last four stories that I wrote were, you know, they had been started in other configurations beforehand, like Instructions for Married Christian Husbands. Um, had, I had already written 10 to 15 pages, but it was a traditional narrative. And so it was the last story I wrote and I wasn't feeling that traditional narrative because I wasn't interested in it, like, oh, you know, they were cheating and then somebody caught feelings. That was boring. Like, you know, yeah, I had nothing new to say about that. But what I liked were two pieces from those pages. And I took the two pieces that I liked and it was, the, and, and I combined them with the idea of um, shifting women from the margins, from being demonized or other to the center of their own story. So if you take the side chick and move her from that place of being demonized, but to the center. And so she has a degree of control. Um, I and instead of- <laughs> I love that story. I have fun. Love, love that shift. I love it. Yes. Love it. And like every single story I found, there was a character that was relatable or there was a mm -hmm. character that reminded me of someone that I knew in real life. Yeah. That was my hope. Thank you. Yeah. 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 So that was it. Like, you know, moving these women to the center, um, flipping the script, you know, and so typically in situations like that, the man is the one who sets the rules for engagement. So what if we moved her to the center? What if she literally wrote the rules in, in this, in the form of this instruction manual? And her so. rules are so good. Like, <laughs> a guidebook. <laughs> you're, yes. in, you're about this life read yes. these and you will be just fine like oh my god exactly yes. exactly own I that narrative it. yeah own it. yeah i love her confidence i love her clarity i love her mm -hmm. boundaries like 
This is yeah. how you navigate a um, messy relationship, have clear yeah. boundaries. Yeah. 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 So I'm curious, like I talk to a lot of writers mm -hmm. um, and sometimes they mention that there's a little bit of like pushback from the publisher, from the editor about, you know, like you said, stories that kind of center Mm -hmm. the, you know black women or the black story sometimes there's, there's a little push to add um or change things or add mm -hmm. things like did you encounter that no and that's the other thing that makes this experience such I, I mean I call it a miracle because I know about those experiences that you're talking about and I was kind of bracing myself for it and I was you know it's like well if I have a choice between publishing this book that keeps us centered or not publishing it, you know, I was prepared to not publish it because I was like, I, I, and I love good editing. I'm not, I don't have a problem. I welcome revision. Um, to me, rewriting is writing, yeah. um, but not the kind of editing that would edit blackness out of this story or these stories or edit us back to the margins. I just, I, I didn't want to deal with that. And I was a little nervous about it. And, um, but I am happy to say that with West Virginia University Press um, as a whole, and then specifically Sarah Georgie, my editor, there was never a consideration. There was so much respect for um, these characters, so much respect for the culture, so much respect for me as the um, authority on these people and this culture. Um, but then there was room for editing that made it better. Like this is the book you're reading isn't the book I turned in. Yeah. There wasn't a lot of editing, but the things that she did was tighten things up, made things clear. Everything that you want from an editor and then, you know, the cultural things, she noted them. And then she asked me questions. You know, it wasn't a, you know, dictatorial kind of situation, which I know from other Black writers, that's what it is, that you got white folks trying to tell you either what it should be or trying to make you, trying to make you think that in order for white people to engage your stories, they have to see them, they have to see white people. And that's just a lie. And right. my book proves that lie. That's awesome. I'm so glad you didn't have to encounter that because I know mm -hmm. some personal friends who have, and it was really mm -hmm. rough on them, like emotionally. You mm -hmm. know? Yeah, it's, you put all of your, you know, it's hard work, you know, you're putting all of that into it and then feeling like somebody who doesn't know your world from Adam has so much control Right. And, you know, and that's very discouraging. Um, but I just had this earlier this afternoon, a conversation with a Greek woman who lives in France and she was telling me how she connected with the story. So wow. I, I didn't, she didn't need any of these women to be white in order to see herself because, and think about it, we're always expected to see ourselves in white characters who these universal books, right? you know, so that's, yeah. I'm not gonna cuss. I was about to cuss. <laughs> I was gonna say that's the bullshit. <laughs> uh, I'm gonna say it. Yeah, it is. It really yeah. is. It really is. It really is. And it's not fair to the writer because mm -hmm. it's our. It's hard enough to put your work out into the world and then yeah. have have people try to like alter it or censor it, mm -hmm. make you more palatable, or try to convince you that it'll that'll mm -hmm. that'll lead you like towards more success. It's, it's mm -hmm. like, it's, like you said, it's very discouraging. So I'm so right. glad I didn't encounter that because, you know, who knows? Um, I'm just happy this book is in the world for multiple right. reasons. Thank you. And I wanted to ask you, like, were you a church girl growing up? Mm -hmm. I okay. was <laughs> for okay. the first 35 years of my life. Um, and what was interesting is that I was sent to church by my mother and my grandmother who raised me but they didn't go to church until I was in college. Oh. And only recently did I really start to unpack, well, why was that? You know, what was going on? And there was some family history stuff 
that now, you know, light bulb, you know, that it went off. I just sort of accepted it. Um, I did ask one time and my grandmother said, you know, when I get right, I'm gonna go to church. And I just remember thinking, even as a kid, like right. church is supposed to be where you go to get right, I thought, you know, yeah. and, and I never really interrogated it more beyond that. Um, because like a lot of people, you just accept church and the role of the church and the teachings of the church without question for a long time. Um, and the questions aren't always welcome either. So it works out for everybody, but then you do start to question. So I started to question a lot of things, but only with this, my book coming out, did I have enough distance to, to really say, wait a minute, now why didn't they go to church? Oh, this is why. And they were grappling with some of the same things that the characters in my book were grappling with, but, but I was so close to the situation and, and it wasn't something they wanted to talk about. And you know how it is, you know, you just don't push. Um, so unfortunately they both have passed away. And so these aren't conversations that I can have with them, but I feel like without even planning to, in some ways in, through my stories, I'm in conversation with them okay. and the feelings that they were, the things that they experienced that made them feel like they could not be in the church, but felt it just completely necessary that I be there, mm -hmm. <laughs> you know, and looking and for me to sort of interrogate, like, what was that about? And what does, um, you know, what is the church telling people such that they both made, you know, felt strongly about that? Yeah, do you, do you feel like, well, I'm curious, have you received any response from church ladies like actual mm -hmm. black church ladies what is what have they had yes so you know some of my favorite responses are from church ladies there's an 80 year old grandma who um I have at her her grandmother I'm sorry her granddaughter mentioned to me oh I think my grandmother would like this book and I'm like really <laughs> you know because I was still you know getting used to this idea that the book would have a broad appeal um but also confronting my own biases. And like I said it right in the book itself, like we forget, we, we, we should be more curious about who our mothers and grandmothers were before they were our mothers and grandmothers. They were whole people with whole lives before us. And that sometimes those lives were at odds, you know, with the church's teaching, or they might have felt some, um, might've been conflicted even though they were in the church. Um, and so, you know, I shouldn't have been surprised that an 80 year old black grandma church lady would appreciate this book. So when she mentioned that, I said, well, I'll send her one. And she said, oh, it'll be perfect. It's, you know, it'll be for her 80th birthday. So I sent oh. Miss Margaret, I know I sent Miss Margaret a book. I was so excited. And then Miss Margaret sent me a card back and told oh. me how much she loved it. And I just like, I was moved to tears because it was this confirmation again that there, we are so black women are so full. We, we contain multitudes, we really do. And so she was an expression of that. Um, and so then I've heard from other women that the book, ha, you know, who consider themselves church women, the book has sparked conversations with them and their mother or with them and other people at church. Um, I've had pastors who are interested in the book, including friends of mine who are pastors. Um, my friend, uh, Reverend Leanne Younger, before the book came out and she knew I was going to do like a study guide, she said, can you do something that will make it possible for pastors to teach this book? And so wow. when I made my study That's guide, right. And I just appreciate like her interest and in her encouraging me. Um, and so there are two versions of my um, uh, book discussion guide. And there's one that's specifically for church folks. And, um, and so she inspired that. And then last week, um, there's a, a pastor, a woman pastor who she and a group of her woman pastor friends want to have a chat like this. And I'm like, I am so down. <laughs> so I'm wow, that's for that. incredible. Like just speaking of the former church girl, like being raised by Bible heavy parents, I find that amazing. Yeah. I'm curious to know what my mom would think of this book, but yeah the fact that there are actual church ladies and there's there might be churches out there talking about these stories that are 
Yeah. A wee bit, a tiny bit scandalous. Yes. You know, um, like, I guess when I think of church, I mm -hmm. think about like respectability and, yeah. mm -hmm. you know, um, sin and heaven and hell and a righteous, a righteous woman and all these different things. So I have like my own bias. Right. So I just, oh, that could just change the game. That could change the game. Right. And that's the thing. All of those things you just said are the things that the church has clung to those things. And it's been at the expense of people who find, who feel on the outside of the church because of those things. And so when churches are trying to figure out how to better connect with people as their numbers are declining, as people are less, you know, Americans in general are less churched, um, you know, they're figuring their child was on you. I think we were both. Um, I don't know if you were there on the clubhouse conversations where there were several this past week about the black church and its rele relevance, the black church and the black lives matter movement, the black church and feminism. And it, I think that it's a reckoning. It's a time of reckoning and the church deciding it are some of the things that the church has held on to. Um, it, do they really value that? those things over the lives of women, over the lives of trans people, over the lives of queer people, because those are the people who traditionally have been pushed away. Um, and, and so, you know, the church has a lot of decisions to make. And, you know, and I think by having honest conversations and about hearing from, you know, people who have been harmed by the church or people who feel like, oh, you know, there's not, Sorry, That's okay. I got a call. I, I did do not disturb, but it didn't work. Um, you know, so it, it's a time of reckoning. So it'll be interesting to see, um, you know, I'd love for my book to be a part of those conversations. Yeah. Um, I was in one book club group um, and uh, it was a black women's book club group. And I kind of got the feeling based on this question that one of the members, she maybe wasn't feeling the book as much, which is fine. Um, but her question for me was, had anyone in the church, first she wanted to know if I considered myself in the church, and then if not, if anyone in the church had questioned sort of like my right to be critical of the church yeah. if I'm not inside of it. And so my response to her was that, you know, because the church does tend to define who's in and who's out which right there, that's part of the problem. But going by that measure, I would be considered now outside of the church. Um, as for whether or not I have a right to critique, I said, well, you could say that I do because um, I'm, I'm writing from a perspective of someone who knows these people and these circumstances and these teachings firsthand. I know enough Bible to be dangerous, I say. Um, uh -huh. But That's also- with those quotes, honey. <laughs> exactly. I was like, she's not playing the game. And I'm like, you know, and the church should want to, and should be open to hearing from people inside as well as outside of the yeah. church. How can you be welcoming otherwise? Yeah. And then finally, the good and the harm that the church has done doesn't stay confined within the church. The rest of us yeah. experience the good oh, and wow. the harm. So I think it's fair game. Yeah. You know, when you teach harmful things, you don't just hurt the people inside the church, you hurt the people outside the church as well. And so there should be some accountability there. Yeah. Yeah, I definitely agree with you. That's one of the things I was wondering, which is why I asked that question. Um, mm -hmm. I wanted to know um, if if the book was being received as critique mm -hmm. you know, or just commentary. Mm -hmm. And I think it can be both. And I think that yes. you deserve both. <laughs> mm -hmm. uh, like you said, like there's certain aspects of the church and like the black church specifically that has mm -hmm. caused like a lot of suffering, a lot of loneliness, a lot of sadness, yes. isolation, self-deprecation. Mm -hmm. You know, there's so many layers to it when it comes to uh, being in a space that is supposed to be safe and it's supposed to be like loving and nurturing and forgiving. Right. You can't really go in there as your full self. 
and you can't really go in there and like tell your whole truth. So mm-hmm. I am, um, I love the fact that it's like, cause when I, cause like I said, when I first thought, I wasn't sure if it was like a nonfiction type of right. cultural critique type thing, which I mm-hmm. would of course as well. But I, I think framing it as fiction kind of softens the blow a little bit. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> I think that was a really smart, um, um, I don't know, smart idea. And I noticed that this is your first not um, fiction piece. Yes. Mm-hmm. So tell me a little bit about your co-parenting book. I'm curious yeah. about that. So it was really a detour. Yeah. <laughs> so it was a detour. Yeah. Um, yeah. Because I was really focused on being a fiction writer. Oh, and okay. then I... Um, you know, but I also just really wanted to be published, right? Because at the time I saw publishing as like, that's what makes you a real writer. And so I was always looking for, you know, ways to get published. And I stumbled into this uh, role as a uh, columnist for a site called Literary Mama, and it was writing parenting essays. Um, And then that led to, and that was digital. And then that led to print opportunities to um, to write um, nonfiction, to write p- personal essays. And so I was going down that path. And then around the same time, my ex um, had, you know, shortly after we were divorced, um, people would like compliment us about how well we co-parented and say, you should write a book. And he was like, yeah, you know, you're a writer, you should write a book. Um, and, Cause he's not a writer. And I thought, you know, it'll be more compelling if we do it together. And so I had to figure out like, well, how do you write a nonfiction book? You know, you yeah. need a book proposal. And in the book proposal, you, sh- you know, you need to show that there's a market for this book to show that you're the right person to write this book and that you have some sort of platform from which you can market this book. Like that's very, yeah. that was very important in publishing because this was after 2008, the market had crashed, publishing budgets were slashed. Um, there's no more sending writers on book tour and all of that. They needed to know that you could move this book. And, um, and so we took some time and we built that platform using, using social media and then uh, also started working on the book proposal. And so that was probably over the course of four years, um, I think about four years, three or four years. And then uh, the book proposal was finally done. And then we sold the book in 2011. It came out in 2013. Um, and so ever since then, it's like, okay, I got to get back to my fiction. <laughs> Here we are seven years later, you know. Um, but yeah, that was a, a big, but very worthwhile, I think, uh, detour from fiction. Yeah. Um, and we didn't want it to be a book about Oh, here's how well we get along. We wanted it to be a book about um, a book that was practical for people. What if you don't get along? What if you're trying to get along and you're co-parenting with someone who is just making it impossible? Um, how do you write a parenting um, plan? How do you navigate when your parenting styles are different? Um, how do you navigate if you and your co-parent are oil and water? Yeah. Um, and, and, you know, and if you guys are more like business partners, which sounds great, what are some of the pros and cons of that? Or yeah. if you're like great friends, there's still pros and cons to that approach as well. Um, so we wanted it to be really useful to people. Yeah. I'm, I appreciate you writing that. I just learned about it. Like after learning about this one mm-hmm. and I'm, I wish I was co-parenting. <laughs> yeah Yeah. so I really I have a lot of admiration and respect and maybe a tiny bit of envy for um what looks like healthy co-parenting situation because it's not easy it's not no parenting is hard and then doing it with by yourself is hard and then when there's somebody like you could be doing better but you're not but I can't choke you but then I got to still be a good parent. You know, it's, it's a lot. It's, yeah. It is a lot. Yeah. 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 And then you have the kid constantly watching. Yeah, right. Always watching. And so it's like, you know, you're trying to show them something, but you're also teaching, you know, 
you worry about like what is the message that you want to send and and then it's different when they're 15 versus when they're five and then there's the shift and yeah. I mean I don't have to tell you like parenting is the hardest thing I've ever ever done and that's with help you know it's still the hardest thing yeah yeah I can definitely relate to that I haven't done anything harder than raising a child and mm -hmm. You know, I've been raising her by myself this whole time. Mm -hmm. Like her father is not, is barely involved, like mm -hmm. barely. And, you know, sometimes I get a little resentful, but, mm -hmm. you know, after years of trying to force him to be involved, yeah. him not, it's like, mm -hmm. oh, I gotta let this go and just yep. do what I can do. Can't yep. make people, you know, so. But and I, I've been on, oh, go ahead. I'm sorry. No, go ahead. I was going to say, I've been on both sides of that because I have this great co-parenting situation and our youngest is now 17. So, you know, we'll always be in each other's lives, but the act of co-parenting is almost done. Um, but my situation growing up was like yours in that I was raised by my mother. I mean, I had my grandmother, but my father was around, but not really and the same thing, my mother was trying to make it happen. Um, and there were things that she did, and I know they were from a place of good intentions, but that ultimately were harder for me, you know? But again, like, now like, I can look back with grace, you know, try, you know like, I, like I, I, I don't, well, you know what? Like, because the message, you know, and I don't know if you're raising a son or a daughter, but I couldn't remember if you mentioned, but like for me as a daughter, that relationship with my father set me up for how I would interact with men and what I could expect and how to create boundaries and that sort of thing. And for my mother, who also didn't have her father, but he was physically like in another state. Mm -hmm. But for her, it was like, oh, well, as long as my dad was local, oh, we gonna make this happen. Yeah. And it was her forcing, I felt like she was not forcing him to, sh to step up, but forcing me on him. And that was okay. not good for me, especially okay. as a girl child, you know, and what I, and, but, but now the grace is now that in, at my big age, I can say she was doing the best she could. You know, yeah. my mom got pregnant with me when she was 17. She oh. had me when she was 18. I mean, what did, what did she did the best she could? You yeah. know, there was no malicious intent. That doesn't mean that I didn't need something different. It doesn't mean that I haven't suffered because of it, but I know that it's not like she could have done better and she chose not to. She did what she knew, knew how to do. Um, but then I've had to learn about reciprocity I've had to learn about um, what I'm worth and not settling. Like those are things that, you know, I didn't learn in how she handled that, right? So if instead she had been like, you know what, this is painful. He doesn't want to be a father. Let's deal with this rejection. Let's deal with this disappointment as opposed to ongoing rejection and disappointment because of how he wasn't showing up, but sort of setting me up for that over and over again you know so in a nutshell we could have a whole other conversation about that but in a nutshell you know that's what um what her choice meant has meant for me and then that's the stuff I've had to heal and unpack yeah yeah that's deep it's really deep how um the relationships we witnessed growing up kind of like teach us what a relationship is supposed to look like right and look like and for better or worse um you know hopefully we figure it out and mm -hmm. try to like break that cycle mm -hmm. or just yeah there's a there's a book that i read that was pivotal for me it's just oh, okay. literally a, a life-changing book called fatherless daughters oh I'm and it's written by two researchers who themselves are fatherless and they define fatherlessness in lots of ways, whether your father died, whether your father was absent because of addiction, whether your father was absent because there had been abuse, um, absenteeism because of incarceration, divorce, 
um, or, you know, because he was a deadbeat, you know, abandonment. So, mm -hmm. you know, when we think fatherless, we have this little picture, but so many of us are fatherless girls. My father was right there in the same yeah. city, but I was still effectively fatherless. Um, and so a lot of the things that we grow up thinking, oh, that's just me, or that's just how I am. Um, they find, they found these um, common traits amongst fatherless women. And so their book is a, a guide on how do you navigate those things? How do you heal? Um, especially if like me, your father has passed away. Mm -hmm. And, um, and that book is so necessary because when I went looking for a book like it, 99% of the books like that were Christian based. Wow. And so much of those Thanks. books, the bottom line was you need to forgive him. You need to work towards reconciliation. First of all, not everybody needs that. Yeah. Second of all, it's not possible because what if he's not here? What if he's dead, you know, or what if he doesn't want to reconcile? The other thing that most of the books I found did is that they, it was a lot of finding comfort in your earthly father wasn't shit, but your heavenly father, find comfort in him. But what if that didn't work? Yeah. Because for some of us, that's not a comfort. So it took a lot. I spent a lot of time on Amazon, but my therapist at the time was like, I don't know of any books um, about fatherless daughters, but she was like, I'd like for you to find one because when you heal that wound, it's going to affect everything else in your life. So I went searching and I finally found this one. And there's also a chapter specifically on how we engage in our romantic relationships as mm -hmm. fatherless daughters and what we need and what is not helpful and the things we have to look out for because of what we bring to it. So very good book. Wow, that is deep. I'm definitely picking that up. Um, mm -hmm. I have a daughter, she mm -hmm. is uh, 19. Mm -hmm. And that's one of the things I worry about uh, when it comes to her adulthood. Mm -hmm. That's actually the main thing I worry about, honestly is mm -hmm. what type of relationship she'll have with men, not just romantically, yeah. but friendship wise right. mm -hmm. as a male boss or a male coworker. Yes. Um, yes. You know, I, I worry about that sometimes. I can be a little mm -hmm. obsessive as an Aquarius. So sometimes I'm really like, okay, how do I help her develop a healthy, um, a healthier perspective on men? Because right now mm -hmm. I've feel like her perspective is extremely negative mm -hmm. you know, because of her father being mm -hmm. who he is. Um, you know, we live in the same neighborhood. He's like two blocks mm -hmm. away. Mm -hmm. And their relationship is not really non-existent mm -hmm. and has been for years. So I'm definitely going to check that book out and see if there's uh, it, it offers me any hints. Because what I have been doing... Mm -hmm which I realized this year is because I never forced her on him, but mm -hmm. I have overcompensated yeah. for most of her childhood. Mm -hmm. Like, oh, the love that you're not getting from your dad, I'm gonna make sure I give it to you. So right. I've gone above and beyond to make sure that she feels loved to the point yeah. she might even be a little spoiled. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and now that she's yeah. 19, I'm like, you're a little spoiled. <laughs> Let me dial this back. Let me see if I can dial this back. <laughs> and I'm like you, I'm a Virgo, but I, I do obsess over those things. You know, I really, really do. And, and if it, I don't know if it's any consolation, but my girls have a great father and I still worry mm. about their relationships with men, not because he slacked in some way, but because, I mean, you think about the things that we've talked about uh, you know, and you may talk about with other women, other black women about dealing with men. Like you could have the best father in the world. I mean, fuck boys don't fuck boy. And you and our girls, if they are interested in men romantically, they got to contend with that stuff. Yeah. So. Yeah, it's frustrating. Um, right. But in terms of parenting mm -hmm. and speaking of parenting, like outside mm -hmm. of the co-parenting book, mm -hmm. you think that being a mom has influenced the things you write about and what do and what do your children think of your uh, think of your book yeah 
So being a mom is actually what drove me to writing because my oldest, who is now 22, oh, wow. I remember her being like a two-year-old who didn't nap. And so I was, and I was a stay-at-home mom. And so I was desperate for time where it was for me and I was not taking care of the house or taking care of someone. Um, and it was very hard to get that time because she didn't nap. And so I would just grab time during the day and um, sometimes just a little bit of writing time. And sometimes she would just be screaming outside the door. It, I mean, it was a lot, um, but I was, um, you know, but that's, that was writing was something I did for myself. I started doing for myself. And then that grew into, you know, having a night each week that I could go out with other women who were writing and, and have some writing time that way as well. And then it just kind of grew from there. And then um, I think it's always been a tug of war because writing like anything takes time. And so it's always been trying to create and, and have set aside time to write amidst trying to make a living as you, you know, I'm preaching to the choir, make a living, take care of everything and everybody, but still, you know, coming back to the writing. Um, and so parenting, um, I've had to tell myself at times, it's better for me to go and spend some time writing than doing, even maybe it's the things the kids want me to do. I'm a better mother when I'm doing what I want to do. And it, yeah. you know, it may seem counterintuitive. I don't know, but to me, it totally makes sense. Um, but I wasn't always able to do that guilt-free. Uh, so, okay. you know, there was that part of it. Um, I, I think one of the reasons I continue to really write fiction, um, not the only reason, but I love writing fiction. That's the main reason. But part of it is um, I, I, I have written personal essays, but I'm always cognizant of my children's privacy and so you know when I used to blog I would blog about them when I used to write uh, for literary mama I was writing about them and one regret that I have is that I didn't learn how to write about being a mother without violating their privacy mm -hmm. um, sometimes when they were little they knew I would blog about them and they liked that but like with anything minors can't give consent and so I wish that I had written less about them and written differently, like figure out how to write about parenting without exposing them so much. So one thing I'm committed to going forward is that when I do, uh, on the occasions I do write nonfiction, um, I worry less about like, are, there, are they gonna be embarrassed by something I write than I am? Are they gonna look at that and say, you had no right because that's, that's my life, you know, um, especially as they've gotten older, you know, next year I'm going to have two adult children, you know, yeah. um, and so there's that piece of it. And then there's the piece where, I mean, this is just me being blunt, like they're not trying to live their lives for me. So I can, you know, I'm not gonna, I, I can't be like, oh, I want to do this, but I can't because what about the children? The children are going to be off doing whatever they want to do, you right. know? That and part. so I, I gotta, I gotta do that. And I think I need to continue. I hope this is what they've taken away from me. Modeling, they, pursuing your passion, pursuing your pleasure, pursuing what feeds you and what nurtures you is important. And that you don't give yourself what's left after you've taken care of of other people. In fact, I hope that I've raised my children to not see caretaking as something that they're obligated to do. Mm. I will never be that person that's like, I can't wait to have grandbabies. I may never have grandbabies and that would be perfectly fine with me because yes. I want what my girls want for themselves and I want them to want the world. Um, I don't want them to aspire to take care of people, you know, because that we saddle girls with that at such an early age. And um, my mother and my grandmother lived to take care of people. 
and didn't get to do the things that they wanted to do. I don't even know that they imagined what did they really want. Um, and so I do it in honor of them. You know, I, they died in 2005 and, and that's when I made up my mind. I was like, I don't have time to waste. So there's this urgency, but I definitely don't have time to waste not writing or not writing certain things because I'm worried about other people. My mother and my grandmother were worried enough for everybody. <laughs> it took care of everybody. I don't have to take care of anybody else. <laughs> Wow, that's so beautiful. Oh my God, thank you for saying all those things. I think I needed mm -hmm. to hear them. Um, Good. Whew, oh my gosh. So, wow. Okay, let me, uh, I, I feel a little emotional. Let me get myself together. And look Take at your my, time. Get my list Take your time. <laughs> <laughs> Take yeah, your time. I, um, you know, there is so much uh, significance to that point. And hindsight being 2020, it's like, I, you know, I know that there have been times where I've like sacrificed my own well being to take mm -hmm. care of, you know, my daughter and even like her father when we were still together. And it's kind of like, oh, you know, if I could have that moment back. But I also know that, that having that moment is part of what's made me who I am today. Yes, that's so, right. I have to accept it as, yep. a part, as it's part of my shaping. And Absolutely. Be um, you know, and I feel like if you were my mom, I think you were so cool with your... <laughs> I know, my kids do not think... Your, um, Let me tell you, know, you that... Scandalous, oh. scandalous church lady book. I feel like my mom wrote that. She's okay, so, so they, are, they are proud of the book. I will say that they are proud of the book. Um, I was surprised um that the that one of my daughters I didn't think she would read it I didn't and she surprised me and not only has she read it but she's um shared it with friends of hers I told her that any friend who wanted a copy um I would send it to them and so her friends have been reading and her friends have reached out to me so I feel great about that but I um mentioned to them the other day I said oh I heard about this hashtag on uh, it's hashtag book talk, like TikTok, but book talk. And somebody was saying, you know, writers are on there and that's the one platform I'm really not on, but my girls are on TikTok. And I was like, so I don't wanna get it. Um, I really don't wanna do another thing, but can you two look into that hashtag and let me know if you think it's something I should be doing as part of the marketing of my book. And my 17 year old, who is a Scorpio, um, <laughs> wrote back, I love you, but no, <laughs> that's not, that's, that's the one. What did she say? It wasn't like, that's not your lane. That's not your, whatever it was. And I'm like, well, damn, just <laughs> hurt my feelings. <laughs> like, mm -mm. Mm -mm. no, no, not for you. <laughs> like, wow. Okay. Um, or, you know, I, because I'm on social media a lot, there are lots of things you know, lingo and things that I know, and they are just mortified if I use any of it with them, or if I, you know, I'm, I'm just supposed to be an observer. I can't participate in the culture because I'm their mother. And so they're, you know, it's they're so unfair. <laughs> it's so unfair. I just, you know, I'm, yep. like, I'm here. I can't sing. I can't dance. I can't do anything. Oh mm -hmm. my goodness. Oh my goodness. The disapproval. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, I'm always, I'm always trying to tell my kid, like, let's do one of them mom and daughter dances. Yeah. You know, let's do like the Megan the Stallion body challenge or something. And she's just like, yeah. not on her watch, you won't. Mm -mm. <laughs> I'm not trying to be twerking with you on Instagram, mom. Thank you, but no. Well, I, and, see, and I'm like you, like, she should be excited. I have a mom who twerks, but no, I guess that's not a thing to get excited to have a mom that twerks. I don't, you know. She does not, she's not. <laughs> Every time I try to like do my little hey. thing, she looks at me like, what are you doing? Why are you doing that? Could you stop doing that? I'm like, Kids are haters. Kids are haters. That's a fact. <laughs> that's a fact. Um, the last chat I had with someone it was an artist uh, named Aisha Bell she 
Mm -hmm. She's a visual artist with two, uh, she has two, two kids, one boy and one daughter. And I think either her or I said that at some point during our conversation that those kids be hating. All the time. They want to put you in, you know, they want to put you in that mommy box and just. Right. One day, usually when we're like 35 or when they're like 35 or 40, or it could be in my case, like after my mom died, it's like when you see your mother as a person, like it's a whole other world that opens up you yeah. know but usually it's late <laughs> <laughs> takes a minute all right let me look at my list to make sure i ask all my questions um okay okay the last question on my list well second to last is so mm -hmm. um what's up next for you are you working on any new books or yeah so um i had a, a novel that i've been working on since 2007 and so as you can imagine excuse me the world has changed a lot. So the novel has changed a lot and it has changed as recently as last night <laughs> when I had an impromptu phone call with my agent about it. And um, because there's interest, thankfully, because of the success of my first book, there's interest in like, okay, what's next? Um, and so I've had to think about, do I want to continue that novel or do I want to write another short story collection? Um, because there's a reason that I haven't finished that novel. I've never written a novel to completion. Um, and so what I'm finding is that part of the reason that I haven't finished it previously is that the stakes in it weren't high enough and it wasn't compelling enough to me. Mm -hmm. And so since I'd say in the last, since January, probably, I've been honing in on exactly, you know, what I need to get rid of in this novel and what I need to really get myself invested in it so that it can be something somebody else wants to read. And so one of the things is uh, that I started to tweak is that I realized I've been very precious with my character. She was such a good girl. And that was the whole premise is that, you know, she was someone who, you know, had really, um, you know, did, done things the right way, but then she has this sort of way that she escapes that goodness and then she gets exposed and then, you know, all sorts of things happen. But I realized that like having a character be that good doesn't give her room to grow or room for, it, it just sort of, um, I diffuses any sense of conflict, right? Um, so if she's unhappy with the world she lives in, or she's living in, and then that world comes crashing down, why would she even care, right? Mm -hmm. And the world is kind of artificial. She's married to a megachurch pastor. Ah. So, but what if instead she was totally invested in that world and then it all comes crashing down? So it's like, okay, some little, you know, it's not little, that's a big tweak, you know, some tweaks yeah. like that. But what I discovered in the last couple of weeks, and it kind of came to a head last night in this conversation, is that this book was about how when she gets exposed, her marriage falls apart. And then her deciding if she wants to rebuild that marriage or if she wants to move on. And I realized, frankly, that I'm just not as interested in women's relationships with men as I am in women's relationships with themselves or with each other. Mm -hmm. um, and so I think one of the shifts I'm going to make is the her relationship with her best friend, yes. um, which is a platonic relationship in this case, we don't have a Eula situation. Um, that relationship had been in the periphery in the novel as I've drafted it so far, but I love that relationship. I love the best friend. I almost love her more than I love the main character, which should have told me something. Mm. And so I think I might have a book that's really about friendship, about two best friends. So that was like an aha moment for me last night. I love that because actually one of my favorite genres, mm -hmm. um, I call it 
womanist fiction. I don't know mm-hmm. if that's the, I don't have a degree in English or writing or anything. Mm-hmm. I don't know if that's the technical name for it. But for me, it's like books that center relationships between women, like black women characters, like mm-hmm. Suma, you know, yeah. or even like Girl, Woman, Other, which, which came out mm-hmm. last year. You know, books like that, where it's not... Mm-hmm you know, the friendship is almost, almost feels romantic because it's so deep. Yeah. And it's intimate. Yes. Mm-hmm. I love books like that. They just, mm, they make me feel so good. I'm excited to read it. Yay. So do you, have a, um, do you have like a daily writing ritual? Like, are you up at four, like Toni Morrison writing for hours? <laughs> I get up most days at like 5.30 or 6 with the intention of writing. And since the since the plague, <laughs> I, I get up with a friend. Like I have one friend that I get up with on Monday, Wednesday, Friday, and another friend I get up with on Tuesdays and Thursdays. Um, and lately though, I've found myself doing other things than the writing, but I'm trying to do a reset now that though that has to be kind of like my sacred writing time. Okay. Um, but, um, you know, I still work. Um, I, I'm a I'm self-employed um, and I have a contract job that I work like 30 hours a week but still oh, from home but it still work and I've got this book tour and 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 you know oh, and so I'm still <laughs> well, I'm sorry I say it again I thought you were I thought you were like yeah. living the I still life. I you know that's like my contract job I get a check from that and it you know, gives me the peace of mind to write um, and the financial stability, you know, because for most of my freelancing life, it was that struggle of like, I'm trying to earn enough money doing other stuff so that I can write. And then my fiction was getting the last bits of me. Um, And then for three years, I had a corporate job. I went corporate and it was in that window of time that I finished my book. Um, but that was, I had a a toxic manager and I literally walked out of that job, August 28th, 2019, um, and never looked back. Book had been sold already and all of that, but I was like, I, and I had planned to finish out that year, but one day I was like, not a second more. I don't know what's going to happen, but I'll figure it out. But I know I cannot be right here. Mm -hmm. Um, And so um, I'm thankful that then I was able to get this contract job and and everything worked out thanks to my friend network. Um, So, so just, you know, so to answer the that's a long winded way to say I'm sort of kind of disciplined with a ritual, but sometimes not, you know, so there's that time in the morning, um, but getting back to making it sacred for writing um, in the midst of this book tour has been difficult. Okay. So, okay. Well, take your time. (laughs) Thank you. (laughs) Don't feel pressured. I will be here ready yes. for whenever it's done and i heard you say yeah. something about a mega church so so you're going staying within the church theme for this yeah week. okay yeah and you know and it's it's i got intentional about church lady stories after i'd written two and my agent suggested the collection but really what i feel like i've been writing is about dissatisfied women and that's the other thing that um okay. i want to make sure that i really zero in on with this next book is this idea of of black women satisfaction in a world that's not concerned with our satisfaction, not concerned with our pleasure, um, in a world where Shonda Rhimes is is told, don't you think you have enough? Ooh, child. You know? My story (laughs) had me hot. Hot, right? (laughs) And so, you know, when we push back and say, this is not enough. and, And by the way, no one else gets to decide for me what is enough i determine what's enough and when the world wants us to have to be satisfied with so little um i'm really invested in these these in stories where women are navigating that they're struggling under the weight of that they're pushing through that um they're suffering but how what does it look like when they come out on the other side of that suffering yes 
Yes, definitely. Um, wow, dissatisfied women. Okay, mm-hmm. so do you think, um, like in thinking about that theme, do you think that mm-hmm. part of the reason why, um, part of the reason why the book is so popular is because mm-hmm. so many women in real life can relate to that feeling of dissatisfaction? Mm-hmm. I think that's what it is. I think because, you know, you don't have to be a church lady to connect with these stories. You don't have to be a black woman to connect with these stories, but all of us can relate to that sense of dissatisfaction with what people are telling us are our options. That's always these damn binaries. You can do this or you can do that and you have to pick and you got to stick with one. You know, you can't, there's this idea that we can't be fluid, this idea that we can't um reject both binaries this idea that we can't um choose even if we choose one of those binary options um that we can't choose the one that feels good to us that uh, our own pleasure is reason enough for making a choice um our own our displeasure is enough to reject something um in in an early incarnation of the novel i'm working on um it, you know, again, the premise is this uh, first lady of a church, of a mega church. She's, you know, materially and financially comfortable. Um, her husband, you know, aside from being very much focused on the church, he's not unloving. Um, and they have a very comfortable life. And uh, someone who, a Black woman who had never been married, um, read some early parts of it. And she said, you know, I hope when you finish this story, that you um, you make it clear why she's unhappy because I don't understand. Because in her mind, it was like, look, she got the husband, she got the house, she got to worry about no bills. What's the problem, <laughs> you know? Yeah. And so th- what that, and if you flip that, she's, that person, that reader was saying what so many people say to black women, well, you've got this, this, and this, why aren't you happy? Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. you know, and they're telling us these are the things that should make you happy. You should only be unhappy if, you know, right. he's beating you or he's cheating on you. But even when they're cheating, it's like, well, but, you know, he's a good provider. Yeah. So, um, and so I'm really interested in that space of our dissatisfaction and our saying, well, that could be enough for you, but that's not enough for me. Yeah. Yeah. You read my mind uh, with <laughs> some of the things you just said. Um, I was trying to pick which story was my favorite and I honestly could not pick. Oh, thank you. <laughs> it was like so hard to choose. Like Peach Cobbler, like that book, that, that not that book, that story actually made me want to like learn how to make Peach Cobbler. Oh, oh I, my God. <laughs> I was like, I was like, I want to feel what that feels like. Feel it. Yeah. Peach Cobbler and sit down and just, eat it like it's a sticky sweetness yes that mess yes. oh my god and yeah there's out. a great recipe for it in my discussion guides if you go to oh, my wow. bio on instagram okay. um there's a great recipe and then awesome. last week i think um someone tagged me on instagram and i put it on my instagram and you can see the picture of all the ingredients she set out to make a peach cobbler awesome. yes and she has the recipe there. So do it, do it, do it. I'm sorry I interrupted you. <laughs> no, that's so dope. I'm glad you know it wasn't just me. Like I like I had a visceral reaction mm-hmm. to, you know, when she was like eating it. Yeah. Um, like I was like, oh my God, I remember that feeling as a young person and like just kind of using food to kind of make myself feel, feel better. Better. You know, and I remember yeah. like almost making myself sick, but not stopping because it was just like the sweet feeling it. Of yes. what I was eating. Mm-hmm. And, and I love um, how to make love to a physicist. Oh my God. That's one of my favorites too. <laughs> I was worried because I was like, this is, am I going to write a happy love story? Because, you know, I'm the queen of darkness. And so <laughs> I was like, think they're gonna be happy yeah I'm telling you, I was surprised I was like is this guy gonna be an asshole like where is this going yeah and then when it ended on a happy note I was like 
oh, that was so fucking wholesome. <laughs> I was debating. I was truly debating I that. I love it. <laughs> I loved it, you know, and JL, for some reason, I yeah. could see JL being a short film. Mm, mm-hmm. I, you know, I could picture the whole thing. Um, but yeah, I mean, I could go story by story. I love every single one. This book is so good. I need to check out the discussion guide so I can get into it a little bit more. And um, yeah, I want to ask you. So in terms of books, mm-hmm. this is the question I ask everyone that I interview. Okay. Uh, you know, not so much your favorite book, but what mm-hmm. is the book written by a Black woman that you think everyone should read? Oh, goodness. Um, this is such a hard question because there's so many. Um, and I'm terrible with superlatives, right? Because it's like, I want to say like 10 books. And it's like the book that'll come to mind. And then a week from now, I'll be like, oh, I should have mentioned. <laughs> okay. All right. So this is how I'm going to answer. Okay. I could name Sula, Toni Morrison. Like, there, you know, there's part of me that wants to name that because ta- that is the d- dissatisfied woman Bible, you know, yeah. right there. Yeah. I think Toni Morrison would love this book. <laughs> I think she would. I think oh, you thank that. you. For real. Thank you. For real. Because <sighs> she was sassy. Like she came off the yes. him, but she was not. Right. Not. We, we, we were reading that. We know <laughs> <laughs> yeah. how her characters got down. Yeah. Um, but I'm gonna choose something else. I'm gonna choose something because it's a book that not a lot of people have heard of. Um, it's called Oreo by Fran Ross. Ah, uh, yes, yes, yes. Yeah, 1974. I was three years old when she wrote this book, and it is considered the first satirical novel by a Black woman. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. And I'm, I'm choosing it because I want all Black, all Black women to read it, to see what's possible, to see we can do not only anything, we can do everything. Yes. Um, and that, and, and I think when we write humor, that always feels indulgent to yes. me because it's from such a deep, a place of like deep agency and freedom. And it's not the thing that we're being encouraged to write. And we were certainly not being encouraged to write this satirical, you know, dark humor, like novel that, that looks at race and sex and class, certainly not in 1974. Right. And, so and Fran Ross, she did that. Yeah. She did it without predecessors doing it. I mean, so Zora Neale Hurston would have been the closest predecessor for, you know, a black woman writing humor, but right. different, you know, totally different era. Um, and the irreverence of it when I think, you know, we're expected to always be earnest, you know, that's some of the respectability. This book completely is completely lacking in respectability. Um, and I want people to read it because she was like us. She was freelancing. Mm. Um, she had a brief stint writing uh, as a, a, for the Richard Pryor show. Oh, wow. And, but she was freelance writing and because she was trying to make a living writing articles, she never got to write a second book. And then she died young of cancer. Mm. And so I think that her, the burden is the burden that so many of us have of this choice of, I'm trying to take care of myself and my family, but there's this pull of this other thing that I want to be doing that may or may not make me any money and certainly may or may not make enough for me to live on. But she did it anyway. She got that one book out before she passed away. And so in honor of her doing the damn thing against all odds um, and expectations, um, that's my choice. I 
Love it. <laughs> A good choice. Oh my God. It's a unique choice. Yeah. Wow, such a purposeful, important choice. Thank you so much. Thank yeah. you. Uh, more people definitely need to know about that book. Mm -hmm. Oreo. Wow. So that was my last question. Oh my God. This has been fun. You're awesome. I'm Thank gonna, you. I'm going to take a photo because I'm just, okay. I want to be archivist. So I take pictures. And All right. Thanks. And then we will close out. It's so weird. <laughs> it is weird. It's the age of Corona. So it you know, is. It is. Differently. <laughs> so thank you so much for oh my gosh. talking thank to me. You. Congratulations <laughs> on this amazing book, The Secret Lives of Church Ladies. I love it so much. And I... I'm so excited about how many doors it's opened for you and also for Black women to uh, talk about these these um, these lives and these mm -hmm. com have conversations about like pleasure and dissatisfaction yes. and secrecy and mm -hmm. um, sexual, you know, sexuality. Like, yeah, I'm all for Black women having those types of like conversations and I feel like you just sparked a move oh. with this so, I hope so. thank you yeah, thank you definitely have definitely have like the closest thing I can think of um there are a couple of non-fiction books that have come out this year that are kind of connected to this topic around like black women and religion mm -hmm. um, and there's there was like Jezebel Unhinged I think mm -hmm. that came out last year but either way um mm -hmm. but yeah thank you so much and okay. I wish you much success. I'm excited for Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much, Ola. I'm glad we connected. Yeah, me too. All right. Bye. Bye. All right, y'all. So that was an uh, amazing conversation. I'm so excited and inspired by uh, Disha's work, Disha's ideas, uh, Disha's writing. Please check out this book if you haven't already. I try not to give too much away in the interview for folks who haven't uh, read the book. I didn't want to do too many spoiler type questions, but I will tell you that if you haven't read it, read it immediately. And if you have read it, let me know what you think. Um, leave me a comment letting me know what you think of this book, which stories are your favorite, um, what do you think of a critique and a commentary on the church within nonfiction work and fiction work. And yeah, I'm going to stop rambling now. So I'll see y'all next time.